Well, there is a 100 kilogram box in front of us. In this video, we'll talk about the tiers of storage, as well as about a high-end NetApp AFF A700 system. Controllers are known to be the high-performance bottleneck of all flash systems. What can we benefit from the NetApp cluster? Hello everyone, here is Tech Lab, and my name is Ilya Bernikov. Today we'd like to talk about FlexPod architecture. FlexPod is the platform that consolidates Cisco server and network hardware with the NetApp storage area network. The very name implies a flexible solution. FlexPod Express serves the needs of small and medium business, while FlexPod Data Center is designed for large installations and data centers. Today we are in the best Russian data center located in Moscow and called Data Space. Here, IT Global Company placed its Russian cloud platform. It is built upon the networking components based on Cisco Nexus switches and computing ones that are the blade servers using Cisco UCS Manager with the NetApp AFF and fast storage area networks. Each part of FlexPod can be modified depending on the original configuration and scaled for business needs. Cisco and NetApp Alliance generally aims at delivering pre-built and pre-tested hardware combinations to operate required software suits. VMware in our case. In this video, we are talking about the tiers of storage as well as about a high-end NetApp AFF A700 system, by using which we are going to extend a current NetApp cluster in Moscow. A700 is running the latest version of Antep 9.7 operating system. We received it with four DS224C disk shelves, with each having 24 SAS SSD drives of 3.8 terabytes. Well, there is one kilogram box in front of us. Let's take a look inside. Here is the NetApp AFF A700 system. It has ATU chassis and an interesting modular design. Both controllers don't have client ports. Network interfaces, the interfaces of disk shelves connectivity, are implemented through expansion modules and separated from controllers. In our case, we have the module with four 12 GB mini SAS HD ports to connect the disk shelves. The NVRAM module has in total 64 GB for the port mirroring system and the bandwidth up to 80 GB per second. There are a 40 GB module for cluster interconnection and a module Unified Target Adapter with four general interfaces supporting 10 GB Ethernet and or 16 GB fiber channel, which depends on the installed transceivers. Controllers and expansion modules support a hot swap. The whole A700 is designed without a single point of failure in the chassis framework. The most interesting thing is that the chassis in such a construction allows swapping controllers of those of the following generation. Four 1,600 watt units provide the system with power. The first and the third power units supply the first controller and its modules, while the second and the fourth ones supply the second controller. There is a cooling system of 12 fans in six modules in front of the A700 SAN. Consequently, each controller has three modules and separate paths. We can also see here two batteries for the power supply of the NVRAM modules, which is quite unusual for the entire SANS. Now we can look inside A700. Let's start with the controllers. There are only ports for USB phone charger, remote management and the console of two types, traditional RG45 and micro USB. The content of controllers is also compact. There are two Intel Xeon Broadwell CPUs that together make up 32 cores of 2.3 GHz, 16 modules, 32 GB of RAM each, in total 512 GB of DDR4 for the controller, and boot device that is a 128 GB SSD. Controllers are known to be the high-performance bottleneck of all flash systems. Due to such powerful hardware, NetApp A700 delivers almost 800,000 IOs during random read performance with 8 kilobytes block and 1 millisecond latency. Let's look at the expansion modules.
The NVRAM has two onboard 16GB RAM modules. If we had a FAS9000 hybrid system, we would see in the front of the modules two NVMe drives, one terabyte each, as a flash cache to increase random read speed. We can take out the module with the network port, unified target adapter, UTA2 in the same way. Obviously, it is the longest network card I've ever seen. For our installation, we will use 10 GB direct attach cables to connect NetApp A700 to our two Cisco Nexus 9000 Ethernet switches. IT Global Team generally uses NFS to access data store VMware, ISCASI to solve the tasks with dedicated loans, and CIFS to play a role of full-fledged file server. It is impossible to give a brief talk on the software and what benefits we get from the NetApp operating system. We held a webinar on this topic, see the link below, where we talked about how SSDs displacing traditional mechanics represented with SAS disks. Now that we made sure the hardware is complete, we can install it and configure. Now I give the floor to Mikhail Novoselov, Senior Engineer of IT Global. Thank you, Ilya. Since we are extending our capacities in the Moscow platform, we will add A700 to the current cluster of the NetApp SAN. Two 40GB Cisco Nexus 3132QV switches operate as the cluster ones, which are consolidated into virtual pro-channel domain. It allows two Nexus switches to be seen as a single underlying L2 logical unit, for example for SAN servers of Cisco UCS complex. What can we benefit from the NetApp cluster? Firstly, we can manage all systems as a single entity. Secondly, the migration of loans, for example, is possible in a dedicated cluster network without impacting the client storage traffic. Now, I'll show you the basics of the NetApp A700 SAN setting up and running. Actually, what matters is that we will use the latest version of ONTAP 9.7 underlying all NetApp systems, at least today's ones and those of the previous generations. GUI in ONTAP 9.7 was redesigned for engineers to get started easier with configuring, in case you work with NetApp for the first time. One can use additional functionality through TLI if NetApp has already been used. We have configured Service Processor SP, or Baseboard Management Controller BMC, in advance and now can manage both controllers remotely. We open the console of a controller and download on tap. The system has a pre-installed 9.7p3 version. For the cluster, we use a newer 9.7p5 operating system version. That is why we should update nodes before adding them to the cluster. We do it through the boot menu and it's option number 7, install new software first. The image should be downloaded through A0M interface. We operate similarly with a second controller to download updates. If we see the invitation to the cluster setup wizard, it means that the update has been completed successfully. We have updated the controllers. Now we can add them to the cluster. Let's configure the management port. Then we select the second option for the question, do you want to create a new cluster or join to an existing one? We are invited to confirm IP addresses of cluster interfaces in a new node. The addresses were automatically generated from link local subnetwork. We should also write an IP address of an existing cluster network. The node has been joined to the cluster successfully. Let's display it from cluster shell. We execute the same operations with the second node. We rename the nodes into something more sensible. We should check for alerts and make sure that the full tolerance of HA pairs is tuned on. We rename the root aggregates similar to existing ones.
The further settings and administration will be done through the cluster interface, so we can close SP addresses, because we don't need them anymore. In browser, we move to the cluster management console. We can see a new A700 system, two controllers A and B, and two connected SSD shells, DDS224C. When we browse the shelf, we can see the disk info. It is very easy to build a data aggregate from not yet active disks. The intellectual system automatically recommends NetApp parameters. We have two aggregates for 66 and 46 terabytes. The aggregates should be renamed according to IT Global standards. All renaming is running online. In more details, you can get more information on the aggregate and its disks, the number of RAID groups, the disk place and function. In RAID DP, a disk may function as parity, deparity or data. The new aggregates are available for storing user data. However, configuring is not completed yet. Now, we should move to the networking. 40 GB E4A and E4E ports, pointing on E4B, are used for cluster interconnection, while E1A and E1B are used for data traffic, so the other ports might be shut down. Cisco Nexus 90380 switches are used as the data ones with the option to create a VPC. That is why we aggregate our ports for data traffic according to OCP. The IP-based load distribution is chosen by default. The aggregation group of ports should be at once added into AOA, broadcast domain with applied MTU 9000 parameter. Now we do the same for B node. Now we have the aggregated ports, but VLANs are not specified yet. Why well, I can do it using GUI or Ansible playbook? To make my video more clear, I'm going to use CLI. Let's come back to the web interface, update the page data, and assign VLANs. Each cluster node has the uniform VLAN set. That is why the logical network interface can be assigned and then moved to any cluster node. To make this fault tolerance automatic, we add the ports of the uniform VLANs into one broadcast domain. I'll show how to do it with VLAN 12 as an example. We successfully extended our cluster up to four nodes. Now it can receive even more data and handle more than 1M IOPS. Now the cluster can store up to 260 terabytes data, which with our compression and deduplication ratios offers approximately one petabyte of effective space. Here were Ilya Bernikov and Mikhail Novoselov. See you soon.